So um, uh, I would like to talk to, uh, today about um, uh, some of the works that we've been doing in the past approximately three years, uh, mostly in the field of computer vision and computer graphics. So the nice thing about computer graphics is that I can show you nice pictures. And basically the main motivation for us is um, the incredible revolution that uh, has happened in uh, uh, 3D sensing technology. Basically, if you go back 15 years, even less, uh, you could find on the market these kind of devices. So if you don't know what it is, it's a Minolta 3D scanner that uh, is big, a big box like this and costs like a small car. And uh, then, of course, uh, Microsoft released the Kinect, which was by all means a revolutionary product. I myself was involved in a startup that was acquired by Intel, and now it is known as the uh, RealSense technology. So basically, these are sensors that uh, could go into laptops or tablets. And very recently, Apple announced their true depth camera that actually is integrated into <coughs> iPhone 10. So basically, nowadays, you can have an affordable 3D sensor that allows uh, to scan the, the world around you and basically get uh, 3D geometric information. And uh, I will show you this example of uh, an application. So this is a Swiss uh, startup company called FaceShift. It was acquired by Apple a couple of years ago. And basically, this is a markerless motion capture. So they capture the face of uh, an actor with a 3D sensor, and in real time, they transfer the facial expression to this, uh, to this green uh, uh, computer graphics avatar. And I think it's a nice uh, visualization or a nice example of uh, several problems that uh, we can talk about in this domain. Basically, we get uh, some noisy, partial, incomplete input that can be represented maybe as an image or as a point cloud or as a mesh. And uh, we want to solve two different problems. First of all, we want to find the correspondence of this uh, noisy input to uh, some reference shape. In this case, could be some canonical uh, human face. And then we want to deform that face to basically to, uh, uh, to fit it to the input data. So that's roughly how the, the, the phase shift uh, application, uh, application works. And uh, I would like mostly to mostly talk about this first part of correspondence. And then hopefully if there is some, some time left, I will also talk about, about synthesis, the, the, uh, the, uh, basically producing new shapes with certain properties. And uh, in computer graphics and geometry processing literature, the correspondence problem is a very well studied uh, uh, problem. And uh, actually, several people in, sitting in this room have uh, introduced some uh, fundamental uh, uh, solutions to this problem. Basically, the shape is usually modeled as a, a manifold, or in the discrete setting, it can be represented as a mesh. And there are uh, basically mathematical models of uh, uh, certain types of invariants that uh, can be uh, can be in incorporated into this problem. For example, if we allow the uh, the shape to deform isometrically, basically without stretching the surface, without changing the, the, its Riemannian structure, uh, we can say a lot about uh, how to find the correspondence. The moment we start deviating from this model, the problem becomes more complicated, of course. And the typical way of uh, posing the correspondence problem, it's a point-wise map. So it maps a point, let's say, on the ear of a cat to the ear of the dog. And we can define, for example, some local structures, basically feature descriptors that capture some local differential geometric property of the surface. And we want the correspondence to match these descriptors in uh, a, a, as good as possible way. And we can also introduce some uh, additional structures, for example, conservation of second-order structures like distances, basically to regularize the problem. And basically, if you went 10 years back, if I asked you how would you solve this problem, of course, by designing some feature descriptor. So this was uh, the, 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 the mainstream approach in computer vision. And geometry and computer graphics uh, more or less replicated this approach, of course, proposing different types of descriptors that are suitable for geometric data. And for example, Leo Gibas, who sits here, uh, int uh, introduced some of the fundamental uh, methods uh, in this domain, I would say, by, computer, uh, by machine learning uh, uh, standards that will be considered probably prehistoric. Uh, uh, prehistoric times, it's about, about a decade ago. And uh, our group as well worked uh, on uh, some, some uh, methods in this, in this domain. The problem, same way as it happened in computer vision, uh, the problem with handcrafted or axiomatic descriptors is that it's very hard to decide what kind of information we want to use uh, for a particular problem. And I will give you uh, this example. So if you want to find correspondence between shapes, 
let's say we have a collection of different humans, we want to find correspondence between them. Uh, we actually want to make the descriptor that is agnostic to the specific structure of the shape. So basically, if I have a long nose or a short nose, I don't care, I want the descriptors to say that this is a nose. On the other hand, if I want to recognize people, if I want to tell apart between me and somebody else, I would probably like to lock, on, lock in on specific characteristics that tell, let's say, my nose or some other structures of my body from uh, somebody else's. So you see that these are very different descriptors for different tasks. And as it happened in computer vision, basically uh, handcrafting a descriptor for a particular task becomes an almost impossible problem. So that's why the community overwhelmingly uh, uh, switched to using uh, deep learning. And of course, the success of deep learning in computer vision also inspired uh, people in computer graphics. So in the past years, we see emergence of uh, a lot of uh, approaches that try to apply uh, uh, successful uh, deep learning methods like convolutional neural networks to geometric data. The problem with the majority of these approaches is that they treat the uh, data in a Euclidean way. So basically, you can think of uh, a three-dimensional shape in two ways, as a manifold in an intrinsic way, or as some object that is embedded in three-dimensional Euclidean space. And for example, you can rasterize it and think of it as uh, volumetric information, or you can consider it as a collection of uh, images, basically range uh, views, or maybe as, uh, as a point cloud. And there are uh, pretty impressive works that uh, try to do it. The main limitation of them that they work with objects like uh, pieces of furniture, chairs, tables, but the moment we, uh, we uh, start deforming the shapes, uh, basically they break down. Maybe the only exception that I can, I can cite here is uh, this impressive work of, of, uh, from the group of Hao Li from the University of Southern California. So they do deformable uh, uh, correspondence between shapes. Uh, very impressive results, but the networks they use are huge. So uh, in, in this particular paper, they used a training set of 50 million uh, uh, examples. The network had something like 200 million parameters, and it took about two weeks to train it. So it's, by computer vision standards, it's probably nothing uh, exceptional, but in computer graphics, that's, that's pretty complex. And uh, I, what I will show you will produce similar results, but will train only on 100 images or 100, uh, uh, 100 examples of shapes with orders of, uh, of magnitude less parameters and uh, much shorter training time. And the main idea is that we actually don't want to consider the shape as a three-dimensional Euclidean object. We want to consider it intrinsically as a manifold. And probably this slide illustrates uh, in the best way what I'm going to say in the next half an hour. Basically, this is a Euclidean view of the surface. When we deform it, the filter that applies to the surface uh, changes, right? Basically, the, the output of the filter changes because the underlying structure changes as well. We want to define the filter on the surface itself. So when we deform the, sur uh, the surface in certain ways, isometrically in particular, the result of applying the filter will be the same. And this way you can already imagine that we don't need to learn invariance to uh, deformations because it will be given by construction. Basically, it will be built into the network architecture. Okay, so if you understand this slide, basically all the rest will be just technical details, how to do it. Okay, so actually uh, maybe a, a little bit on a personal note, uh, uh, I started looking into these problems uh, um, when uh, Jan uh, gave a, a talk about deep learning at Tel Aviv University in 2014 and I asked him basically if he knew any uh, methods that apply uh, CNNs to geometric data and he referred, uh, referred to his paper with Jean Bruna on spectral CNNs that for us was a source of inspiration and we ended up doing something very different and I will explain how different and why different. We submitted this paper to a computer graphics conference. It was uh, of course rejected, but uh, <laughs> since then I think we had slightly more luck. So I think now it's, it is considered less and less exotic, hopefully. And I think this workshop is good evidence that basically these methods start uh, being adopted. So basically, as uh, it was already mentioned, especially in the session on Wednesday, uh, uh, basically there are, uh, you can construct uh, generalization of um, convolutional neural networks on uh, non-Euclidean domains, in particular graphs, manifolds can be treated in the same way, uh, in the spectral domain, basically replacing uh, the convolution by uh, pointwise product of the Fourier transforms. Now, this works very well. Basically on general graphs, probably there are a few, a few other things that you can do. But one of the limitations that was also mentioned several times is that it's difficult to generalize 
uh, these kind of filters across different domains. So basically, if I have a fixed graph, I can learn filters and they will work perfectly. If I have two very different graphs, filters that I learn on one graph will not work on another graph. And this is a simple illustration. This is the filter, the spectral response of a filter that I basically handcrafted. And this is its spatial realization on a manifold. So you see that even I deform the horse almost isometrically, uh, the filter is very brittle. It changes a lot. Okay, so again, this is, I, I should say, this is a disclaimer because we've seen results from Joan, uh, basically the Gromov-Hausdorff analysis. What can you say about uh, the stability of these filters when the, 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 the underlying domain changes uh, epsilon in the sense of some metric? And also Leo presented the spectral transformer networks that allow, at least to some extent, to, to cope with this problem. The second difficulty of spectral methods is that basically the spectral kernels that we produce basically by applying, for example, Chebyshev polynomials to the Laplacian are isotropic. So here you can see uh, examples of spectral filters on, on the grid. On the grid, the Laplacian is uh, rotationally invariant, so we get these uh, actually very uh, dull and non-interesting filters. Basically, they're just concentric circles. So uh, the, if, you, if you worked with such filters in computer vision, probably you will not, uh, you will not get uh, too far away. Yeah. So on the many good, excellent question. So as I will show in a few minutes, so on the manifold we have much more structure, so we can do much better. Okay. So I will not be talking about spectral methods on manifolds. Right. And again, here I should say uh, it's with a disclaimer. On graphs we can also do better. So we had a poster uh, about motif, uh, motif nets that uh, take into account uh, local uh, subgraph structures called graphlets or motifs that uh, basically allows to define some kind of anisotropic diffusion on graphs. Okay, so the approach we'll take here uh, today will be very different. Actually, we don't want to work in the spectral domain. We want to generalize um, the convolution in the spatial domain. And the idea is to replace the notion of a patch of pixel uh, in an image. Basically, the way you can think of convolution in uh, tra traditional convolution in images, you extract a patch of pixels around the point. You multiply it by some template. You sum up the results, right? You get convolution or correlation, and you move it to the next location. So we want to do the same thing on the manifold. And the way of doing it, you define a local system of coordinates and you map the values of a function that lives on your manifold uh, to this system of coordinates. And basically it can be reformulated as constructing a system of weights, basically local weighting functions that uh, produce, uh, um, uh, produce a multidimensional vector uh, that describes this page. And if you think of uh, of the standard Euclidean case, basically you can think of each pixel belonging to a patch as a small weighting function that basically that extracts these pixels. It will be a delta function in this case. So on the manifold we can do something similar, but of course we don't have any shift invariance in the sense that the very way of extracting this patch it will change as we move to a different position, right? So basically uh, the patch extraction operator and image is exactly the same at each and every position. Uh, on the manifold, it will depend on where, uh, where, I, I, uh, where I put my page. Okay, and actually, uh, we did something uh, for, uh, for uh, extracting such pages, uh, again, by machine learning standards in prehistoric time, about five years ago. So we called it uh, uh, intrinsic, uh, uh, intrinsic shape context descriptor, basically generalizing the, the, the famous shape context descriptors to, to manifolds. Uh, and the idea was to use a local... Uh, uh, geodesic polar system of coordinates. Basically, we have uh, a distance from a point. The radial coordinate is geodesic distance. And the angular coordinate is just basically uh, flattening the circle and uh, splitting into, uh, into, for example, equispaced angles. So basically, if we look at it, at this system of coordinates, basically, if we plot it as a polar system of coordinates, we have a fixed system of weights. So we can use Gaussian weights and here you can see the level sets of these Gaussians visualized. So each Gaussian, think of it as a pixel. Basically, it extracts locally uh, the values of a function in that page. Okay, and we can define the convolution in this way. We extract a page at each position. We multiply it by a template, sum up, and this will be the result of the convolution. You can already spot a problem here. And uh, on manifolds, we don't have uh, a canonical orientation for patches, at least not straightforwardly. So basically, we can rotate this template or the patch in an arbitrary way. So we denote this ambiguity in rotation by delta theta. And basically, the convolution is not well defined or not uniquely defined. So there are several ways of coping with this problem. Of course, one would be to fix some reference direction, right? And uh, this could be basically any tangent field, preferably, uh, preferably something intrinsic. 
Uh, we can also uh, solve it differently. We can take the standard Fourier transform with respect to the angular coordinate, with respect to theta. So basically this ambiguity, the shift, will become a complex phase in the Fourier domain. And if we take the absolute value, we get rid of the phase. So basically we can take the Fourier transform magnitude. And the third option is to keep all the possible rotations. So basically you can think of it as uh, applying a rotating filter. So this actually has been uh, uh, has been presented at CEPR. There was a paper about rotational invariant CNNs that used exactly the same idea uh, for images. We did it for manifolds two years before. And we call this angular max pooling. So basically, we keep all the rotations of the, uh, uh, of the filter and then take the maximum. And basically, this produces a, a unique result for the convolution. And we learned these filters. So these are the, the free parameters corresponding to the standard uh, filters in the uh, in the Euclidean case in classical CNNs. Okay, and this is how the toy architecture would look like. Basically, we can uh, apply several layers like this. So here I uh, would say that the problems that I will be considering, namely the correspondence problems, we don't have any pooling. You can do pooling as it was also described for graphs by basically by coarsening the underlying mesh. Here we are interested in problems that are similar to semantic uh, labeling or segmentation in computer vision. We want to output a result for each vertex of the mesh or for each point of, of, the, of the manifold. Okay, so what can we do with these uh, intrinsic convolutional neural networks? One thing uh, that we can, uh, we can do is learning optimal descriptors. So basically we'll use a Siamese configuration of, uh, of this uh, uh, geodesic convolutional neural network. Basically we have a, a training set that consists of examples of corresponding points. So basically we have positives and negatives, points that correspond and points that don't correspond. Here the corresponding points are encoded by similar color. And we want the descriptors at corresponding points to be as similar as possible and descriptors at non-corresponding points to be as dissimilar as possible. So basically we, we uh, couple together two uh, identical copies of this geodesic CNN with shared parameters and we find parameters that basically minimize this hinge loss, basically uh, promote uh, similarity between descriptors at similar points and dissimilarity at dissimilar points. And let me show you a visualization of how these descriptors work. So I cannot visualize multidimensional descriptors, I can visualize distances. So here you see a distance from the white point here on the shoulder to all the rest of the points on the mesh and also uh, some other shapes. Right? And this is a handcrafted descriptor called heat kernel signature. So it was introduced in the group of Leo Gibbas about 10 years ago. And it's based basically on uh, heat kernels of the, uh, of the Laplace uh, Beltrami operator. And the, you can see that this descriptor is very uh, poorly localized. Basically it's a low pass filter. So if I move a point a little bit, the descriptor almost will not change. This is a different descriptor uh, from the group of Daniel Kremers, wave kernel signature. It's based on a different uh, formulation without going into details. Basically, it's uh, solutions of Schrodinger equation. So it is better localized, but it's uh, very spurious. So you can see that, for example, points on the belly will be similar to points on the shoulder for some reason. Here, uh, cold colors represent smaller distances in the descriptor space. And this is the descriptor that we learned with uh, geodesic CNN. You can see that it's much more discriminative and much better localized. And indeed, if we evaluate using some standard criteria like uh, ROC curves or cumulative matching characteristics, we see that uh, the descriptor performs uh, significantly better than uh, the handcrafted counterparts. Okay, so this was one uh, way of constructing these intrinsic uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, I will not go into details. Basically, there are some technical limitations that make uh, all this construction problematic in some points. Just one example. Basically, uh, when the radius of this patch is too large, basically when it's larger than the injectivity radius of the manifold, we might end up having something that doesn't look like a disk. Basically, it might have a different topology. So we thought of a different way of constructing these patches. And uh, on manifolds, uh, a very natural notion of distance uh, comes from heat flow. Basically, we can solve the heat equation and look at the heat kernels, basically they gave, give natural intrinsic way of, uh, of measuring distances, so, yeah. Excuse me, so when you do the convolution on the shape, was there a signal on the shape that you convolved and what was the signal? That's correct, so basically you can use anything you want, it depends on the application, you can use, for example, even the coordinates themselves. You can use something intrinsic, you can use some handcrafted descriptors like histograms of normals, you can use texture if you have texture, uh, yeah, so it, it, it depends on the application, yes. 
So basically, if we look at this uh, diffusion equation, this is how it's uh, expressed. So this is uh, the simplest homogeneous uh, diffusion equation, basically meaning that the diffusion properties are constant and independent on the position. So basically, the, uh, think of this horse as made of a material that conducts heat in all uh, directions in the same way, and each point is, is exactly the same. So this is, of course, not very interesting because we want something that also has orientation. So we want to consider an isotropic diffusion that looks like this. And basically, this is a type of equations that has been heavily considered in prehistoric times also. Uh, uh, famous works of Perona Malik, uh, uh, Rudin Osher and, uh, Osher and Fatemi, uh, Weikert, and many others, uh, basically in PD-based uh, image processing and computer vision. So here we do it on manifolds. So I remind you that on manifolds, we actually have a slightly different situation. We don't have a global system of coordinates. So this is how it looks like. Basically, the difference between isotropic and anisotropic diffusion. In the first case, uh, the heat spreads uh, uniformly in each direction. In the anisotropic case, you see that uh, basically it propagates faster vertically. Of course, the term vertically here is totally inappropriate because everything is intrinsic, so it's with respect to some local uh, system of coordinates. So on manifolds, uh, the gradient is actually uh, uh, a, um, a tangent vector. Basically, we don't have a global system of coordinates. We have locally Euclidean structure that is called the tangent space. So uh, the gradient is a vector in the tangent space. We can apply to it a transformation. In this case, we'll do a rotation matrix and a scaling matrix that basically creates the anisotropy in certain direction. And the direction now is not globally defined. It defined it's defined with respect to some local system of coordinates. So basically, you can use any tangent vector field to define locally these uh, canonical orientations. We call this the anisotropic Laplacian. And basically, it now has uh, two extra parameters, the orientation theta that steers the, the, the diffusion direction, and alpha that determines basically how elongated these heat kernels will be. And this is how they look like. We can basically we can change the orientation, the scale, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the degree of anisotropy. And basically, again, if we look at these uh, kernels, basically these are the weighting functions that we'll use in our page operator. If we look at them in the, uh, this local polar system of coordinates, you see them as basically as these Gaussian-like blobs at different directions and at different scales. So we call these uh, anisotropic convolutional neural networks. That was uh, an Eps paper uh, in 2016. And uh, it works better than uh, geodesic CNNs for various reasons. Basically, it's more stable. It's, uh, easier to compute, and here again you can see these uh, these local descriptors visualized as uh, the distance uh, in the descriptor space. So the next thing we can do, and this actually doesn't have an analogy in the classical uh, CNNs, we can actually learn the page operator, right? So basically, so far we considered a setting where all the weights, weight, the weighting functions were fixed. So either uh, these. Uh, uh, a geodesic polar system of coordinates or the, the heat kernels, we can actually consider a system of uh, parametric weighting functions, for example, Gaussian kernels, right? And basically, we can include the parameters of these, uh, of these kernels into the learning procedure. So the way it will look like, basically, we have a local system of coordinates. Again, think of rho and theta, the geodesic polar coordinates. We define Gaussian uh, weighting functions on, uh, uh, in these coordinates. And the spatial convolution, basically, again, will be this local weighting in the patch. And you can see that, basically, we have here the weights, right? These are the, the coefficients of the filter of the template that we apply to the patch. And these are parameters of the patch. So if we exchange summation and integration, this is nothing else but the Gaussian mixture, right? So basically, we model the convolution as a Gaussian mixture where we learn the, the weights of the Gaussians and the mean, and, uh, mean vectors and covariance matrices. Okay, so that's why we call this mixture model network or uh, Monet for short. And basically, you can see the difference. These are the handcrafted pages, so to say, with fixed weighting functions. Here, uh, we allow to learn the weighting functions. And uh, basically, if we initialize with, uh, with, uh, with the Gaussians of the GCNN, we end up with some different system of weights. They actually look nicely, almost symmetric. But for example, this way, we don't need to worry about the size of the page. Basically, it will be decided automatically during the learning, basically, by moving the Gaussians appropriately. Okay, so we can use this, uh, of course, to compute descriptors. Actually, I would like to show a different way of computing correspondence. We can compute correspondence uh, as a labeling, right? So basically, if we consider a specific class of shapes, let's say humans, uh, we can pick a human shape and say, this is our label space, right? So we can think of it as a reference shape. So basically, it will, be, it will correspond each 
query shape to this, uh, to this selected reference. And basically the output of the neural network at each vertex uh, can be considered as a probability distribution in this label space or on this reference shape. So roughly speaking, the probability of point X corresponding to a point Y on the reference. Okay, and we can minimize the standard uh, loss that is used in classification problem, the cross entropy basically between the two distributions, the ground truth distribution and the one that we obtain with the network. Okay, and the, the way we uh, evaluate the correspondence, basically once we get this probability distribution, we can pick up the maximum, and then we can measure how far it is from the ground truth distribution on the reference shape in the sense of uh, geodesic distance, and uh, this is called the, the Princeton correspondence benchmark that is widely used in, uh, in the computer graphics community. So basically, this way we can evaluate the correspondence error at each point, and then we can average it on the entire shape, and this will give us a good idea of uh, how good the correspondence is. Actually, we can uh, do a slightly more detailed analysis. We can uh, take a radius around the ground truth correspondence and, uh, and ask how many correspondences fall within this radius, right? And plot it as a curve. So uh, basically, the higher the curve is better. And this is the result that we obtain. So let me just give you for reference basically what we see here. The yellow curve is one of the state-of-the-art methods in computer graphics, blended intrinsic maps, introduced by, uh, by Jaron Lippmann and co-authors. And uh, this method doesn't use any, uh, any learning. So it was a good method in computer graphics, but you see that in comp by comparison, it performs very poorly. So this was uh, one of the first results of learning-based correspondence using random forests. This is what we get with different uh, um, intrinsic uh, CNN models. This is the result of Monet. So you can see that basically the maximum error we produce is about four centimeters. So four centimeters is about the, about the finger size. So it's a very good correspondence. Maybe to better visualize it, uh, we can plot the point-wise error. So hot colors here represent uh, large deviations from the ground truth. So this is what is produced by blended intrinsic maps. It's pretty bad correspondence. This is what we produce with geodesic CNNs. This is an isotropic CNN, way better, and this is Monet. So here you can see the correspondence is almost perfect. White means that the correspondence error is zero. And indeed here we have about 90% of points that have close to zero correspondence. Maybe another way of visualizing it, we can take some texture and map it using the correspondence that we produce. And you can see that the texture mapping is nearly perfect. We can see only very mild uh, distortions of this texture. So this is a very good correspondence. Now this is a more challenging setting. So here we also have topological changes. Uh, these are uh, range maps of these, uh, of these shapes. And you can see that uh, nevertheless, even though we have missing parts and connectivity, uh, uh, connectivity changes, uh, the results are pretty good. And here again, color coding represents corresponding points, so uh, uh, we see that this is also a very good uh, correspondence. Yeah. How would the results look if I were to uh, analyze on, say, human shapes, but obviously with different data sets? Like, talking about the same? So, uh, we don't have, uh, for this method, we don't have this result. I will show it uh, afterwards. But basically, these are different shapes, right? They are taken from different data sets. They are, uh, basically, they are rasterized. So we, uh, we produce synthetic range images. So they are very different, right? So they have different topology, different connectivity. Everything is different. OK, so, yeah. Uh, what do you mean? So we don't find any global optimum. Actually, uh, the correspondence is, uh, is solved uh, in a local way. So this is actually a problem. And that's exactly what I, I'm going to talk about. So basically, considering correspondence in a point-wise manner is problematic. So first of all, two things. First of all, considering it as a classification problem is, uh, is bad because we don't distinguish between uh, two different outcomes of misclassification. So this is a misclassification, right? My correspondence uh, brings me here while the ground truth is here, so it's definitely a misclassification, but which one is better, the, the blue one or the green one? Obviously the blue one, right? It's closer in the geodesic distance sense to the ground truth correspondence to the gray point, but it will be treated equally to the, uh, to the green one, right? So we want to make the, the loss function uh, geometrically meaningful, and the way of doing it is basically take the probability distribution that is, is produced by the neural network and average it uh, weighted by the geodesic distance. So basically we look at uh, uh, 
we, we take the geodesic distance from the ground rules to a point on the reference shape and multiply it by the probability of, uh, of x corresponding to that point, right? So we call this soft correspondence error. The second problem is more fundamental and uh, basically it has to do with the fact that at training time we can force the points, uh, nearby points on the, uh, on the source shape to be mapped to nearby points on the target shape. But at, uh, uh, at test time, we, we don't have any means to do it, right? So in principle, nothing pre prevents a point x prime, which is close to point x, to be mapped to point y prime that is very far from y, right? And this, this problem in computer vision is called uh, structured prediction or structured output. Basically there, because the image has a fixed uh, structure, basically it lives on a grid, there are relatively simple methods of dealing with it. Here, we, we don't have a fixed structure. We basically, each shape can come with a different mesh uh, uh, or different connectivity. So uh, basically, we need a different way of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with the problem of structured output. And it's time to uh, switch the uh, correspondence model. And uh, basically, instead of considering point-wise correspondence, we'll consider functional correspondence. This is a concept that was introduced again by the group of Leo Gibas. He mentioned it in his talk uh, on the first day. Basically, the idea is instead of mapping points across shapes, we would like to make map functions uh, across shapes. Basically, functions living on, uh, on our manifolds. So basically, we lift the problem to, uh, to, the, uh, to the space of functions where the correspondence is actually a linear operator. Right, and what is nice, uh, uh, what is nice about this formulation that uh, on the space of these functions we can define an orthogonal basis, so we can expand a function that lives on uh, on the human in uh, in an orthogonal basis, let's say of uh, uh, Laplacian uh, eigenfunctions. Right, we take first k coefficients, and we can do the same thing for the second function. So basically, this way in this basis, the correspondence operator can be described as a matrix of fixed size. In this case, it will be k by k, right? So this is how this matrix look, looks like. So this is a matrix that encodes the correspondence between the, two, uh, between the two shapes, right? And basically, what we need to provide is a set of probe functions. I denote them by g and by f that roughly correspond. T here denotes the correspondence operator that, again, in the discrete setting can be represented as a matrix. So if I project these uh, probe functions on the respective Fourier basis, basically I get the Fourier transforms. Here I denote them by G and by F hat, right? So basically the number of frequencies in the Fourier transform is K. Q is the number of probe functions. Basically I get a linear system of equations that I can solve in the least square sense and it has a closed form expression. I can write it as pseudo inverse of F hat multiplying G hat, right? So basically that's a way of uh, extracting this, uh, this functional correspondence. Now, if I look at it in the spatial domain, basically, you can think of it as a, as a low rank approximation of the correspondence matrix, right? So I have a rank K approximation that takes the forward Fourier transform, changes uh, the, the set of uh, Fourier coefficients to a new basis, and synthesizes in the new basis on another shape. So basically, because it's a low pass filter, right, it will take a, a delta function on one shape and map it into some blob that might actually have negative values. So if we normalize this, we take absolute value and normalize uh, everything to, to sum to one, basically we can consider it as a probability distribution, right? So basically, functional map produces as uh, a probability distribution of a point on one shape corresponding to, to points on another shape. Okay, so we've seen the, uh, the Siamese descriptor learning before. And the problem uh, there was, of course, that we, we might have a good descriptor uh, at each point, but the overall structure of correspondence is not, uh, is not maintained in any way. So basically, here we replace this Siamese descriptor learning with learning through the functional correspondence. And basically, the intrinsic convolutional neural network, you can pick up your favorite architecture, geodesic CNN, anisotropic CNN, whatever. It produces local features that we uh, project on the Fourier basis, we get the Fourier coefficients, we compute the functional correspondence, map it to the, uh, to the uh, spatial domain, and this gives us the probability distribution, right? And with this probability distribution, we minimize the, the, the geometric loss that we've seen before, the soft correspondence. Okay, so this is a fixed layer. The only thing that has parameters is uh, this uh, intrinsic CNN architecture. This is a fixed layer. We need to differentiate through pseudo inverse, which fortunately you can do in TensorFlow, for example. And uh, this way we uh, learned, uh, learned structured output. So if we are happy with the previous results of the, uh, of the mixture model network, 
This is what we obtain with the functional uh, map network. So you see that it almost saturates the Faust benchmark, and probably it's already time to replace the benchmark. It's probably already not very interesting. And this is another example. So you were asking uh, about uh, different shapes. So Faust actually comes in different flavors. These are the, the raw scans that were not uh, remeshed. Uh, they have different topological artifacts, uh, connectivity issues, missing parts. And uh, again, by the time the paper was published, it was the best performing generic algorithm. It was slightly outperformed by uh, the algorithm of Michael Black that was targeted for human shapes. But I, I would like to emphasize that here it's a generic correspondence algorithm that can be trained on any data, not necessarily humans. So I think it's, it's a good result. Now, I have probably a couple of minutes left. I would like to talk a little bit about the, the opposite problem of 3D shape uh, synthesis. And again, I remind you this slide that we've seen in the beginning. Basically, if we are given some noisy input that comes from a 3D sensor, uh, we, we basically we solve first the correspondence problem, right, to bring it to some, uh, to some canonical shape, let's say human. And now we want to produce a new human shape, basically to deform this canonical shape to match the input. So, Basically, this will be some kind of scan completion, right? And actually, this uh, work, it's a uh, recent work that I, uh, we did with uh, several collaborators, uh, is inspired by the, uh, by the surface uh, net uh, that uh, Joan presented uh, in his talk. And basically, the way we address this problem is with a variational autoencoder. So basically, we start with a collection of shapes that, that, that have uh, uh, ground truth correspondence. We produce a latent space representation, uh, what we usually denote by vector z, right? That basically represents the the pose and the uh, and the and uh, and the structure of the shape. So we don't actually decouple between the pose and the structure. That will be a good thing to consider in future work. And then we have a decoder. Basically, all these uh, decoder and encoder use uh, intrinsic convolution operations to produce uh, from this latent representation a pose, basically an embedding of this shape. Okay. So once we train this. And the training is done using standard uh, variational autoencoder techniques. So basically, we minimize the, the error between the original shape, basically the x, y, z coordinates of the points, and those that are predicted by the, by, the encoder, by the decoder. So once we trained it, we discard the encoder, and we are given a partial input that we assume to, to, be, uh, to, to, uh, to have a known correspondence to the, to the canonical shape. So that's the ugly part. We don't solve the correspondence. Uh, problem together. Basically, we assume it to be given. We, of course, can do it automatically using the methods that I described previously, but it would be, of course, much better to solve it end to end. And given this, uh, par uh, the par uh, this partial shape that I denote here by red, we optimize now in the latent space to generate a shape that is as close as possible, in some sense, to this partial shape. So basically, we synthesize a shape that has certain prescribed properties. And this is how it, it, it looks like. So first of all, these are random shapes uh, generated from the from this latent space. So they look reasonable. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. Uh, we can do, of course. Yes, please. Can you say you represent the output? Sorry. And this is how you represent the output. So the output it's uh, it's a mesh with given connectivity. So basically, the output uh, uh, is just a collection of three uh, D coordinates of the points. In a particular order. In a particular order. So that's the ugly part. So if it was uh, not in the particular order, so basically you, you need uh, to solve a correspondence problem inside. We solve it separately. So we pre-compute the correspondence. Okay. So how many points do you typically have for a shape like this? So uh, this is dynamic Faust. It's about 7,000 points. So basically, as we've seen in many talks here, we can do different things. We can do arithmetics in the latent space. So here is an example of interpolation. So you can see that all the intermediate steps look pretty human-like, uh, human right? So basically, the shapes produced are meaningful. Uh, this is a comparison of different shape completion uh, 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 algorithms. So of course, we are not the first to work on this problem. I think this is one of the state-of-the-arts, 3D EPN. This is from uh, uh, work from Matthias Niester. I think we produce much better result, both uh, qualitatively and quantitatively. So here are some, some uh, meaningless numbers sh showing that this works slightly better. Uh, here are some additional examples. So I think this is the Berkeley data set with Kinect scans. So basically, they're given as point clouds. And we are able to get pretty nice looking uh, completions. This is an example of Faust. Again, uh, a lot of missing parts. And I think the, the, uh, the matching results are pretty good. 
maybe just one thing to show that, of course, this problem is very ambiguous. So, for example, if I cut both uh, arms of the human, I can complete uh, the shape in many different ways, right? So basically, the torso and the legs will be the same, but the arms can move in arbitrary ways. So it's not a bug, it's a feature. Basically, it shows that we can produce uh, many, meaningful, uh, many meaningful outputs. And finally, we can do dynamic fusion. So again, this is maybe a naive approach to dynamic fusion. So here we have multiple uh, views and multiple deformations of the shape. We fit, uh, basically we, we uh, fit our model uh, to each of them, and then we uh, average them in the latent space. And this is the result that we obtain. So again, it looks meaningful. And uh, basically, because we have multiple inputs, uh, the overall quality of this reconstruction is better than from a single input. Okay, so I think I will stop here. I would like to uh, mention my uh, numerous collaborators on these projects and uh, different funding uh, sources. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>